Hi, my name is Vody Hodge and I'm here at the Creation Museum today. I'm actually in the Dragon Hall bookstore and we wanted to talk a little bit about Dragon Legends and right behind me we have St. George and the Dragon, probably one of the most famous dragon slayers uh, in history. And in fact here at the Creation Museum we have St. George in a number of different places. I can see him up here to my right. You may not be able to see him at this point but we have this uh, a particular one right behind us. We also happen to see St. George in our wall Walkway, right as you come in that's kind of our dragon legends area and we have a lot of different dragon legends in there and that's what we're going to feature today we're going to walk through some of those and of course if I'm going to be talking about St. George and the dragon and some of these other dragon legends it's only fitting that I have my dragon legend mug so I had to bring this with me on this particular uh, trip we do sell, sell these actually at the creation museum I know a lot of people have been buying them uh, so that's really exciting. But as we go through the, the bookstore here, I just wanted to give you guys a taste of the theme inside the Dragon Hall bookstore. If you kind of look up and around, you see a, a little bit of a taste of some of the Dragon Legend uh, decoration that we've got here to kind of theme this uh, particular bookstore. So it's really nice, and uh, you'll get a taste of uh, and maybe a feel of like a castle um, you know, I've been to a number of castles uh, in uh, places like England and some in Wales, and I've had the opportunity to see some of the, the, the dragon accounts that they actually have from history over there. Now, what's interesting, as you uh, uh, go through a number of different dragon legends throughout the past, we have some dragon legends that I think are a little bit more than a legend. If you consider, you know, a legend is something that's, it's got, a, it's got an element of truth to it, but it might have been embellished. But a lot of the things that we call legends today are actually written as historical accounts. Now, we do have petroglyphs and a number of different aspects of dinosaurs and dragons and the connection between dinosaurs and dragons when we see some of these images. But I want to be able to talk about some of the different legends specifically as we go through this. So follow me as we go through the store. And we're going to get out to the main hallway and we're going to take a look at some of these dragon legends. I know what you're thinking too. You're thinking, boy, I wish I was at the Creation Museum looking at all these books. Uh, we do have a number of books, of course, uh, on dragon legends. And I'll tell you about some of those at the uh, end of this program. But we have a lot of resources here for kids, a lot for teenagers, a lot for adults, a number of resources on dinosaurs and dragons. Those are probably some of the favorites I would suggest for kids and teens. You know, we're in a culture that talks a lot about dinosaurs. And in our culture, they're usually given the secular view of dinosaurs. And when we start with the Bible, the Bible actually makes sense of dinosaurs. You start with the Bible, God made dinosaurs uh, on day six of creation. Now compare this to dragons. Dragons and dinosaurs are not necessarily the same thing. For example, all dinosaurs could be dragons, but not all the dragons could rightly be called a dinosaur. Let me explain why that is. A dragon is more of an overarching term. It would include flying reptiles. It would include serpentine reptiles, even sea reptiles. But dragons, dragons are actually a very specific definition. A dragon has hips so that it raises its body up off the ground. So it's technically a land animal then. It's a reptilian creature that has one of two hip structures that do that. So with that in mind, a flying reptile or a sea reptile technically are not considered dinosaurs. But remember, those would have been made on day five of creation, the flying and the sea creatures. So as we follow the, the subject of dinosaurs down through the Bible, they were created by God. They're originally perfect. Because of man's sin, death and suffering came into the world. And we, we got a chance to see death. And uh, we've seen, of course, all sorts of dinosaurs go extinct since that time. And uh, you can see we're stepping out of the bookstore now into the main hall. But uh, these dinosaurs, as they've uh, been down through the ages, have essentially went extinct. Now, one thing you need to understand is the flood of Noah's day makes sense of most of the dinosaur fossils that we have all over the place uh, in different rock layers, uh, usually in the Cretaceous, Tri Triassic, and Jurassic sediment. That's where we find the dinosaurs buried. 
Now, as we look into our hallway here, there's a number of different dragon legends, and we're going to start right down here, right as you enter. For those of you who don't know, this is the main entrance to walk into the Creation Museum. So a lot of people walk in here, some people walk in down there. We've got one of our parking lots out here, another parking lot. So we're, we're kind of right at the very beginning of the museum. So people walk in and they get this grand design of dragon legends. And even if you look up above us, we've kind of modeled this after some of the dragons of the east up above us. And if you were to turn around and see the, the other direction, you can see this one hanging right above us. So we wanted to give some flair to this right as people walked into the Creation Museum. And so you'll notice that we have a number of different just call-out displays here. And these are actually part of the posts. And if you look at, uh, there's, this is one, and we can just go ahead and start here. But uh, uh, they talk about various dragon legends that we find from all over the world. So in this particular one, uh, we're talking about the Hydra in Greece. We're talking about the Red Dragon of Wales, Quetzalcoatl, and uh, Bell and the Dragon, uh, which is mentioned in the apocryphal literature. So some of these are actually much better accounts. Some of them are not as good of accounts. But what we've got is we've got accounts that actually outline these different dinosaur-like, dragon-like creatures from various parts of the world. And this is just four of those. One of my favorites is the red dragon whales. I'll show you a flag of, of whales uh, here in just a little bit because it's still the flag of whales. It's an ancient flag and it's got this dragon on it. And I've always been fascinated by it. Quetzalcoatl here, for example, is uh, down in Central uh, America, you know, where they've talked about this flying uh, reptile, this flying serpent uh, that would uh, uh, sometimes attack and, and all sorts of things. Bell and the Dragon is mentioned in, not in the Old Testament, but it's uh, in the apocryphal literature that's sometimes attached to Daniel. So it's an ancient piece of literature. And then the Hydra, uh, which is in Greek mythology. Now, of course, with Greek mythology, you got to be careful. They sometimes interconnected certain creatures, so you have to watch out for some of those. And so uh, out of these four, I would say the Hydra is the one that I probably wouldn't trust the most. But the sheer fact that it's mentioned and is discussed by some of these ancient Greeks uh, probably gives us a taste that there's probably some truth back behind that. Let's move over here to the very first one as you walk in the museum. And this is another one of these call-outs. And this is talking about uh, some of the depictions from various parts of the world, particularly uh, what we see here is stuff in South America. In fact, I've been down to Peru, and I've been to some of the areas where the Mashi culture was. And uh, if you look at this pottery right here, kind of uh, uh, from the ancient Peruvians down here, I actually took that picture in the Museum of the Nation down there. Um, what's really neat about this is as we were touring through these various places, they were uh, over and over again, the tour guides would say, they, these people, they only drew things, they only made pictures of things that they saw. And then we would see some, some creatures look like dragons and, and then they just had no idea what to say. Because in the modern idea, this, this idea of dragons is that they're a myth, that they're not real. But if you look historically, they were clearly real creatures. They were documented in historical accounts. We see them in pictographs and so forth. But what had happened was as dinosaurs were dying out, uh, somewhere between the neighborhood of the 1500s through the late 1800s, because there were fewer and fewer of them, sometimes people got this idea, well, maybe they were a myth. And of course, we started digging up dinosaur bones and people just, for some reason, did not even connect dinosaurs uh, with dragons and some of these other creatures. So you'll see here some uh, uh, watering pottery. They would put their water in there and, and where they, they would make these were down in like the Nazca Desert in Peru. It's one of the driest deserts in the world, if not the driest. Um, they get very little rainfall and yet sometimes they'll get fog because it's actually not too far from the ocean but by the way the weather patterns are they get hardly any rain so water was very precious to them and they would dig wells and they would put some of this water uh, in these but notice how the the design is it's it almost reminds you of a condenser if the water goes to evaporate it goes through these it kind of recondenses and falls back in it's actually a brilliant design if you think about it but of course it's what's on these that grabs people's attention you have some dinosaur dragon-like creatures uh, once again on this pottery down in Peru they'd find it on some rocks and of course you know there are people who started making forgeries of that too but there are some legitimate ones uh, we'd see it on textiles and different things people pulled out of the graves so that was really neat now if you move up to some of these others up here in the upper right uh, we do have one uh, it's a Native American pictograph 
out at uh, uh, Utah, and uh, there you kind of see a picture of a person there. That's our own buddy Davis. He's been out there and has observed this one, and and uh, he likes to do some of this as well. You know, him being a dinosaur sculptor, he really enjoys. Uh, being able to uh, look at some of this uh, ancient dinosaur type stuff. Now, this looks kind of like a flying reptile. Now, it's interesting, you know, you can see somebody put an outline around it, although it's not perfect. I know uh, in the secular world, they cannot have humans and dinosaur-like creatures or even these flying reptiles living side by side with man. So when Native Americans drew this particular image, they were like, no, 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 this, this can't be one. So they've tried to come up with all sorts of reinterpretations. And this is one of them that sometimes comes under attack by the secular world. They want to reinterpret this. They say, well, maybe that's a man on top and maybe kind of in the middle part. Maybe that's like an alien bent over. And then you see a snake and, and they, they just kind of try to put it all together. But uh, really, if you just look at it without those preconceived notions, it does resemble some sort of flying reptile. If you move over to the left side here, uh, this is one over in Angkor in Cambodia. An ancient temple had been rediscovered. And what's interesting, you'll see reliefs of all sorts of animals. And if you look at this, it's a huge temple complex. Now, I've not actually been there, but I have corresponded with someone who had been there. And there's animals all over this that are uh, engraved or etched and made, you know, to, to look like various animals. Now, this one in particular, you look at it, and you can't help it, but this kind of resembles a stegosaur. Now, it doesn't look exactly like a stegosaur uh, because you don't see the tail spikes and so forth, things like that. So, obviously, he's not just looking at a modern image that we have of uh, some sort of stegosaur to make this. So, what it probably is, it's probably a variation of something like a stegosaur after the flood, it might have been muzzled. I know there's a debate in the peer review process where people are talking about this right now, but clearly it's right next to other real creatures. So whoever it was that made this clearly thought this creature was a real creature. Now what's interesting is uh, some of the researchers over there think they found now a second stegosaur-like creature uh, in that complex as well. So that's kind of an interesting subject too. But we find these types of things all over the world. If you go down here, uh, uh, the, the Narmer plate, uh, you can see some creatures on here that look very similar uh, to a dinosaur, kind of a long neck. You know, think of sauropods, stuff like that. What we have is their bone structure. It's always difficult for us to say, okay, based on the bone structure, what exactly did they look like? You know, if we look at something like an elephant and we just look at their bones, we'd have no idea they had these big ears or big trunks and so forth. So I think sometimes when we look at some of these old actual depictions that people have of dragons, they put extra features on their face like little beards, tongues, and different things that are coming off of them in some instances. They were probably looking at the real creature where all we look at today is the bones of these dinosaurs. So sometimes these guys might actually have had a little bit more of an accurate de depiction of some of these dinosaurs and dragons. All right, well, let's continue down through here. Uh, as we walk through, uh, you'll notice this is kind of the, the, the entrance, kind of the, the exterior part of the old building, and of course we filled it in. Uh, with all the windows. But if you look to the left side, you'll see it, it looks like rock, doesn't it? Now, it's not actually rock. And if you ever get the chance to come here to the Creation Museum, I want to show you something. If you look closely at this rock and you go up and touch, I mean, it really does look like rock. It's actually not rock. <laughs> uh, we actually work with people who did some expert modeling for these types of things. And this is actually modeled after a particular canyon. And you'll see different, what looks like rock layers, this is modeled after a real canyon that really is like that. And, uh, you know, we wanted to do that because we talk a lot about the flood. And, of course, you know, dinosaurs are buried in the flood sediment and so forth. So it kind of gives us that taste of a museum. And we have this on the exterior part of the museum as well, uh, uh, done as, you know, as really neat parts of uh, uh, these rock layers out there. All right, we've come to the next one of these uh, dragon legends. And uh, here we have two different ones. We have John of Damascus and we have Marco Polo. Uh, I know as soon as I say Marco Polo, uh, Marco, you know, everybody wants to think of the swimming pool game. You know, Marco Polo, and you swim under the legs and all that. And, you know, I've seen funny skits on that. But Marco Polo was a real person. Uh, he was actually, back in the 1200s, the 13th century, he traveled to China to document uh, what it was like there. And he spent a number of years there. And when he was over there, he actually encountered a number of different dragons. Now, in places like China, Japan, the Far East, 
there are quite a few uh, dragon legends over there. There are more the long, slender dragon. We call that the eastern dragon. But uh, he had a chance to, to talk about some of those. Uh, one of the things that he, he, he actually documented, that some of these things were huge and had uh, uh, eyes as big as a loaf of bread, just to give you an idea. Um, they would oftentimes be, be similar to a snake, but a gigantic snake, but they would have four limbs. So they would actually have legs, and uh, for a foot, they'd have just kind of a short claw, that sort of thing, which is exactly what we see with these eastern dragons, uh, long slender ones. So you look up an eastern dragon, you're going to find a lot of images of that. If you've ever been to a Chinese restaurant, you may have seen their 12-year zodiac. They have 11 real creatures that represent 11 years, and then they have a dragon, which represents another year as well. So it goes to show, even in these eastern cultures, they viewed the dragon as a real creature. In fact, you can find ancient cookbooks and things like that that actually had various parts of the dragon you cook up in different stews. Well, let's look at the top one here. We have John of Damascus. Uh, he lived in the 8th century, so I think 700s. John of Damascus wrote a book on dragons and ghosts. And really what he was trying to do in here is he's trying to distinguish what were real and what were fictional, particularly when it comes to some of the creatures. So after uh, describing some of the dragons as large serpents, uh, he actually went on to say, and I, I wanted to read this one, uh, there is one more kind of dragon, those that have a wide head, goldish eyes, and hoary protuberances uh, on the back of the head. They also had a beard protruding out of the throat. This beard is uh, sort of a, or, uh, sorry, this dragon is sort of a beast like the rest of the animals, for it had a beard like a goat and a horn at the back of its head. Its eyes are big and goldish. These dragons can be both big and small. All serpents, or all serpent kinds are poisonous except dragons, for they do not emit poison. So it's just interesting. He's talking about this like it's a real creature. They're documenting different creatures. He views this one as a real creature, and yet he gives us a bit of a description. You know, when it comes to dinosaur bones, for example, we have no idea what their eyes looked like. In this instance, he's talking about the eyes are big and they're goldish. And he's also pointing out that they do not emit poison. So we can actually learn things from these different historical accounts when it comes to talking about uh, dragons and some of the different dragon uh, legends that are out there. So we're going to continue through here. And, you know, this is actually strange to me because every time I'm in the museum, it's so full of people. And yet because of the coronavirus, here we are, and it's just empty and it's quiet. But uh, I guess that's great for us recording, but I want to encourage you, uh, when the Creation Museum opens back up, come and enjoy these exhibits and have a great time while you're here. All right, this next one, you know what? I might stand on the other side over here. That might be easier because we've got tables and we have some stuff set up out here. Uh, here we're talking about Kircher and Herodotus. And uh, both of these uh, guys uh, would talk uh, readily about dragons. Uh, Herodotus is known as the father of history. He was an old uh, Greek uh, historian. He actually traveled all over the Middle East, different places, and, uh, you know, I've quoted him a number of different times. But he talked about the winged serpents uh, that fly from Arabia. And a number of ancient commentaries would talk about these. They, they were like a, like a snake that would fly. And uh, they were very poisonous, and uh, they would come in. But what's fascinating is the ibis birds love to encounter them even in mid-flight, according to a number of these old commentators. And Herodotus is no different. Uh, these serpents uh, were like water snakes. Their wings were not feathered, but they had wings like a bat. Think of a membrane, and they would fly. And everybody really liked the ibis birds because they would attack these serpents and uh, prevent them from getting there and, you know, apparently putting poison on people and so forth. Uh, so that was kind of neat. But I've read that from a number of uh, ancients as well. But Herodotus, I mean, he was, he was considered an excellent historian, and so, uh, you know, I mean, when you read something like this from someone of this stature, it gives a little bit more credence to it, I believe. Uh, if you look up here, Athanasius Kircher, he lived in the 1600s, and he was a brilliant guy. And uh, he wrote some books and uh, uh, talked about different creatures. One of the ones that he talks about here, of winged dragons, dispute has only arisen between authors, most of whom declare them to be fanciful, basically fictional uh, but these authors are contradicted by the histories and eyewitnesses. Winged dragons, small, great, and greatest have been produced in all times and in every land. Now, here's why I wanted to point this one out. Kircher here, in the 1600s, this is when we started to see a decline in the dragon legends. So as these dragon legends start to reduce, 
about the 1500s all the way through the 1800s, we start to see a massive reduction of them, a, a far fewer uh, accounts of actual encounters. And I've always wondered, is this the time frame? Is this the, the phase when a lot of these dinosaur and dragon-like creatures were being killed and eliminated from the earth? If you think about this time frame, this is when people were really starting to get to different parts of the world. They were draining swamps. A lot of the old uh, accounts had uh, these dragon-like creatures living in swamps or living underground. So a lot of their habitat was probably destroyed. Here, he's even pointing out that they often lived in what they would call caves. Uh, and have different layers and things like that. So here, they'd already started dying out, particularly the flying ones. And so he said, you know, people are already at that stage starting to say, hey, maybe some of these flying ones were fanciful or mythological. It really wasn't until the 1900s, the early 1900s, when people started to say dragons were a myth. So by that particular time, the majority of the dragon legends have really started to drop off. We just don't see them anymore. And it was in the year 1910, a couple of different encyclopedias mentioned that they thought that dragons were, were a myth because they couldn't find them anymore. So I guess this idea that they had died out completely escaped them. Well, at any rate, let's continue to look at some more. Right back behind us, uh, you'll see a little bit more. We have a few uh, displays right here, and sometimes people walk right past these as they go through the museum, because like I said, it's usually really crowded in here. People are wanting to go into the museum, so they sometimes walk right past these signs. But uh, here's a really good question. Were dinosaurs dragons? Now, dinosaurs and dragons are not exactly the same thing. All the dinosaurs, like I said earlier, could be considered dragons, but not all the dragons are dinosaurs because of their hip structure. So I think that's confused a lot of people. But I've always wondered, when they started digging up dinosaur bones, what would have happened if they would have just called them dragon bones? Would there even be a controversy over the distinction between dinosaurs and dragons? I think they would have been able to easily lump those in. So it talks about some of that in a little bit more detail. Here we have a, just kind of a chart of the whole world uh, outlining where some of these different dragon legends come from that we're discussing in here. Of course, there's so many more. We've got books on it, and you can find old histories and, and, uh, and so forth uh, all around the world. It's really neat uh, reading some of these from the Australian Aborigines or your freedom in South America or Asia or Europe. You know, when you think of dragons, people usually think of medieval Europe or they think of the Far East, uh, places like Japan and so forth. But really, we find these all over the world. All right, well, let's continue. Right behind us here, we have an encounter with the Romans. And the Romans, we have some old writings. Uh, there was a number of times that they actually encountered a dragon. I don't want to go into too much detail with this. But here was one that's uh, a dragon that suddenly crept up behind a Roman army. <laughs> the leader's like, kill it. <laughs> so they basically took it out. And uh, they actually measured it. And uh, once uh, they'd skinned it, it's, and they sent the skin actually back to the Senate, uh, it measured at 120 feet long, and the thickness and its width was about the same by the time they had it skinned. So uh, we see a number of these, you know, some of them as late as the 4th century uh, AD. So, I mean, we, we find these all over the place. So cultures all over the world really were encountering dinosaur dragon-like creatures. Now I want you to notice this particular dragon, at the end of it, was killed. And we, we see this with a number of these. In fact, you look at most dragon legends around the world, most of them ended with a dragon getting killed. Now, think about that. You know, what happens to a population of dragons? These are, these are in many instances, these were fearful creatures. Uh, people were scared of them. And a lot of times when the fear is bred, they've wanted to wipe them out. That's just kind of what's happened throughout history. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if mankind was heavily involved in the extinction of these particular dinosaurs and dragons. If you look up above us here, you can see another one of these eastern-like dragons. You can see it's a long, slender. This one here is like a snake. You don't see any of the legs coming off of this one. You know, if you flip to the Bible, and a lot of times people don't, don't just immediately look at the Bible when they're thinking of uh, dinosaurs and dragons, but the Bible in the Old Testament in the King James Version actually talks about dragons uh, over 20 times. And if you uh, specifically look at a, you know, a number of old translations, there's a couple of different Hebrew words that were translated as dragon. And so you see that throughout the Old Testament, but we also see specific creatures. And that's what we're seeing here. On the left side, it's talking about a critter called behemoth. And on the right side, it's talking about a critter called Leviathan. Now, Behemoth and Leviathan are both mentioned in the book of Job. We also see Leviathan mentioned in Psalms and elsewhere in Scripture. But Behemoth, 
uh, is in Job chapter 40. And we got Job chapter 41 uh, uh, through, uh, uh, excuse me, through uh, verse 24, and it gives a description of this creature. Now, this is some sort of a ma- massive creature. It has no fear going out into a flooding Jordan River. Uh, it's compared to uh, a number of other creatures in the general context in Job chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41. So it was clearly a real creature. He was made alongside Job. He eats grass like an ox, and yet This is some sort of massive creature, the first of the chief of the ways of God. One of the things it says here, if you see in verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar. Now, there are some Bible commentaries that footnote this behemoth that say, well, maybe it was an elephant or maybe it was a hippo. Now, that doesn't seem to make sense of a tail that moves like a cedar. If you've ever seen a cedar tree move, they're they're solid, they're more, you know, they might kink a little bit more. You got big cedar trees, small cedar trees, but the point is, they're fairly rigid, and they're, they're fairly significant tails. Now, if you look at a hippo tail, they have hardly a tail. They have a little flap of skin that moves back there, something like this. It's not even remotely close. Elephants have this little, little bitty tail that just kind of flips and flops, and it moves around like a weeping willow trying to knock bugs off the back of its back. Uh, so it's not even close. But when you look at the description of this, it's actually very similar to something like a sauropod dinosaur. Now, am I saying that's exactly what it is? I don't know for sure, but it really does seem to fit that description. If you move over, uh, we see a, a creature called Leviathan in the very next chapter, uh, Job chapter 41. Now, this is a water creature, so technically it's not a dinosaur, but it's still uh, lumped as a dragon. In fact, Leviathan is called a dragon in scripture uh, elsewhere. This is some sort of fascinating creature, this Leviathan, because it actually breathed fire. And the Bible talks about a handful of creatures that shot fire. Uh, Back in the book of Isaiah, it talks about the fiery flying serpents. And if you go back to the books of Moses, in Numbers and Deuteronomy, it talks about the fiery flying serpents. So seeing Leviathan do this and these fiery serpents doing it, it's not a big deal. Because this is an all-powerful God we're talking about. It's not a problem for him to create creatures like this. But the point is, when we step back and look at this, behemoth, Leviathan, dragons, we do see that these were real creatures living back in the past, and apparently they've died out since that time. All right, let's continue down here. We have about three more displays to look at, and we're back to St. George. We started off with St. George, and St. George is probably one of the most popular dragon slayers. He slayed a dragon in North Africa. Uh, He was a Roman soldier, just to give you an idea who he was. He was living about A.D. 300, and he was in North Africa, and he was going to meet up with his troops. And uh, he came across this place where this lady was tied to a stake, and she's going to be eaten by this dragon. Well, come to find out what had happened was this dragon had been terrorizing this pagan village. And so they started sacrificing to this dragon to try to appease the gods. So they were sacrificing sheep. And uh, finally, they ran out of sheep, so they started sacrificing people, and they were casting lots, casting dice, basically, uh, to see who would get sacrificed. Well, one day, they cast a lot, and it fell on the king's daughter. That happened to be when St. George came by. So here was a princess tied to a stake, and uh, she was about to get eaten by this dragon. Well, St. George, he went out there, he stabbed the dragon. He didn't kill it. They ended up taking it back to the village where they were able to slay the dragon right in front of everyone to show them that it was just an animal. And it was interesting, the king had asked George, what did he want as a reward? He said, I only desire that you believe in God. And uh, the way the account uh, goes, the entire village gave their lives to the Lord and were baptized. So it's kind of interesting. You never know what your actions may lead to. But St. George is a patron saint of quite a few places throughout Europe. Uh, I've been to Windsor Castle, uh, the queen's home. And uh, when you go there, there's actually uh, the chapel of St. George there. Uh, so it just goes to show uh, uh, far reach of St. George. I've been at uh, Gamlestan, the old town of uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and there's a huge statue of St. George killing the dragon there as well. So St. George is probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular dragon legend that's out there. All right, let's look at these next two. And I'm going to sit my mug down here. I've got some books I'm going to tell you about here in just a moment. But actually, while we walk down there, I'm going to show you a couple of flags. This first flag I mentioned was from the flag of Wales. Let's see if I can hold this up for you. This is an ancient flag, one of the four kingdoms of the United Kingdom. And you can see the red dragon there of Wales. Ancient uh, flag, uh, which is fascinating. It goes to show uh, their view of dragons. But 
you know, in different places, the old Bavarian flag in southern Germany had a dragon on it. The old Mercian flag in central England had one. Now let me show you the eastern dragon. Let me get this one out of the way. This is the old flag of China before the founding of the Republic of China back in 1911. So prior to that, you had this dragon. This was basically the, the old Chinese flag. And uh, you can see how it's the long, slender dragon. It had the, the, the feet on there and, the, and uh, the legs. But notice how it has five toes. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in China, no one was allowed to have a five-toed dragon except for the royal family. Uh, so it kind of gives you an idea of that. But yeah, once again, this is an ancient flag too. All right, let's look at Beowulf. Uh, many of you uh, had to read Beowulf when you were in uh, uh, your school days. And uh, I had to read it. It's actually uh, uh, written in an older English style, but its setting was in Scandinavia. Uh, Beowulf was, uh, he was actually from what we would call Sweden today, uh, where the Geats were. Think of uh, Gothenburg, that particular area. And uh, Beowulf ended up going down to help out uh, some of the Danish nobles and uh, the king down there because this dragon that they named Grindel kept attacking and killing it. It was a pretty vicious dragon. So uh, Beowulf went down there, and he ended up attacking this dragon when it came, and he, and he ripped its arm off, basically pulled it out of the socket. And so it was bleeding to death. It goes back to its lair. Well, they track it back there, and they go into this lair near a swamp, and uh, lo and behold, they discover that Grendel has a mother, <laughs> and they ended up having to kill Grendel's mother as well. So he, he ended up killing those two dragons. But what's interesting about Beowulf is later in his life, he actually encountered one of those larger fly, fiery flying serpents. And uh, he ended up killing it, but he sustained enough injury that he actually ended up dying as a result of it. But uh, Beowulf was mentioned in history. We, we're, I, I know people, some historians think they know right where he was buried, actually. So he was a real person. Uh, some of these events uh, probably definitely happen. Have they been uh, uh, embellished a little bit? There's, there is that possibility. But what's interesting is Grendel, if you look carefully at the description of Grendel given throughout this, uh, this uh, uh, epic poem, Beowulf, it's actually very similar to a creature we have today that we call Baryonyx. It's basically a, a two-legged dinosaur. It's got short arms on the top and the two big walking legs in the bottom, but the short arms, it makes sense uh, that you could possibly rip one of those arms off. But Baryonyx literally means heavy claw. And what that means is it had this big claw right down there on its little arms, and Baryonyx has, has that claw, and the description uh, in Beowulf was very similar to that as well. All right, let's go over here and look at another one. And we hope you guys are having a great time with this. Uh, you know, um, because we're so busy doing this, I haven't been able to take questions or anything like that, but I'm sure kids probably have all sorts of questions. And uh, if they have questions, hop on the answers in Genesis website, type in your question. You'd be surprised how much is already answered on there, even on our answers in Genesis kids website. Uh, you can find a lot there too. Now, this is probably one of the most recent uh, dragon accounts, and it's probably one of the latest ones that I found, with the exception of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 1902 edition, which has an entry for sea dragons. But this is in 1890. Gives you an idea how late some of these dragon accounts went. Now, this is with a flying reptile that was actually killed uh, out west in the desert. And what's interesting is a couple of ranchers came across this thing. Uh, it looked like it was all wore out. It, uh, it, they, they described it as like an alligator-like creature with these gigantic wings. And these wings from tip to tip actually measured 160 feet. But uh, they had their guns and they decided that they were going to shoot this monster. And they shot it and they wounded it. Well, it took off. Well, they were able to track it. And uh, they got within shooting distance where they were able to finish it off. And a bunch of people from the town came out. They actually took measurements of things. They, they actually snipped off the wingtip. They actually took a portion of it and sent it back to some of the uh, universities uh, back here in the eastern part of the United States to have it, uh, uh, you know, so they could just do further study on it because it was such a unique creature. But by its description, it's something very similar to think of a pteranodon, one of these large flying reptiles had uh, two feet, uh, you know, down toward its uh, bottom side had some pretty vicious teeth on it as well. So it's unique to see that these went as late as the late 1800s. By this time, a lot of these creatures, I would suggest, had died out. Now, are dinosaurs uh, and dragons completely extinct? That is a great question. Uh, for me to say yes, I'd have to look everywhere in the entire world at the exact same time, and I'm not that good. 
So what I like to do, hopefully you had a great time with this, I want to show you uh, some resources. Let me grab some of these because I've been involved in writing some of these things. And uh, first thing I want to start off with, I know this is tough for me to grab, is some cards. These are actually Dragon Legend cards. And what's neat about these, there's, there's five copies of each one in here, so you can get one and you can trade them with your friends. But it talks about some of these legends that we just talked about that are on display here at the Creation Museum. One of the books that I was involved in is called Dragons, Legends and Lore of Dinosaurs. Laura Welch and I put this book together, and it is a brilliant family book. The, the artwork is brilliant from uh, Bill Looney. It's got some, some of the different flip tabs that open up, talk about some of these different dragon legends, petroglyphs, some of these counts in history. Where's the word dragon found in the Bible? This book made the top 200 children's books in America when it first came out. And hopefully you guys can still hear me. I know I got the mic off of me here. Uh, I also love this book. This is Dire Dragons. This is from Vance Nelson. And he has tried to document all sorts of different petroglyphs and drawings and things like that from all over the world of different creatures that are very similar uh, in looking to dinosaurs and dragon-like creatures. And uh, I'm just giving you a taste of it. But this is a beautiful full-color book. So I would encourage you to consider that. It's called Dire Dragons. And then the last one, I want to... I want this one for the kids. I would say if you're about seven years old on up, you would probably love this book. And when I say on up, I mean it because adults love this book too. But uh, the same person who did the illustrations uh, in my Dragon Legend book, he did the illustrations in here. Beautiful illustrations, facts and figures about dinosaurs, but it also follows the seven Fs of dinosaurs. And uh, everything has to start with an F, right? So it's formed, fearless, fallen, flood, and it goes through basically chronologically. And one of them uh, is talking about when they were faded and then how fiction came in and people start to say that they're a myth. So it does talk about these legends uh, from a chronological perspective, starting with the Bible as the absolute authority. So these are some excellent resources and I really hope that you enjoyed uh, just taking a glimpse of some of these dragon legends. This is a taste of what we got here at the Creation Museum. I hope you had a great time with that. God bless you. And I want to encourage you too. If this has been a blessing to you, consider a donation to the Ministry of Answers in Genesis. Uh, we survive on donations, and at this time with the coronavirus, we really appreciate any amount that you could give to us. And uh, so we would re really appreciate that. Hop on our uh, website, answersingenesis.org, and you can uh, click donate. Uh, small amounts, we really appreciate it. Big amounts uh, can only help us uh, further while we're going through these particular times. But we also hope that you'll be praying for us here at the Ministry of Answers in Genesis. Thank you and God bless you all.